Hello, everybody. So I'm here to talk about English colonization. In my regular history class, when we um, start out, I sort of skip chapter one. I mean, it, because it's United States history, and chapter one really goes into a lot of the European stuff. So for chapter one, I expect you just to be able to read the book and be able to answer the questions on the study guide. So we're going to move right in, uh, and I'm going to talk pretty quickly because it's you can watch this over and over again and watch if you're having problems sleeping. So let's start with English colonization. English colonization begins around 1584. Sir Walter Raleigh, he discovered uh, Roanoke Islands uh, near North Carolina. And Raleigh was one of these people that were adventurers looking for uh, glory, make money. Uh, and they thought that the new world would provide all that. So he found Roanoke Island and the natives seemed friendly. So he thought, well, this is a good place to start a colony. So three years later, 117 colonists arrived under the leadership of a John White. And they set up, and it didn't start out well because they planned fairly well. They had brought carpenters, blacksmiths. They had bought grain so that they could grow their own food. But the ship carrying the grain hit a rock, and the salt water hit, and uh, ruined all the grain. After about a year, White leaves to go back to England to get supplies. Now, he's delayed because of the Spanish-American War. And when he gets back, uh, he finds out that the, the village has disappeared. And it's known for a long time as the Lost Colony of Roanoke. And there's always whispers uh, out in the past that that these people had gone out and they may have been living with a tribe. And so there's always this search for this missing tribe of colonists. Uh, the only clue that we had was that there was a, a note on a uh, tree that said Croat. They did find some skeletal bodies. So they, they probably, uh, probably were all killed. But to be certain, they are dead now. So let's talk about settling the Chesapeake. In 1603, Elizabeth I dies. Her son, James I, son, not her son, James I, son of Mary, becomes king of the, and begins the so-called Stuart dynasty uh, because Elizabeth was the virgin queen. She had never married. During James's reign, most of the 13 colonies will be founded, at least in the Stuart era. And the colonies are going to be very diverse in geography. They're going to be very diverse uh, in their composition. In 1606, England makes peace with Spain. And this was important because this means that England can free men up for colonization and exploration. And so the first group that decides to do some more colonizing will be the Virginia Company. Now, to, the Virginia Company is what we call a joint stock company. It'd be like any other company today where you have investors and they would invest into the Virginia Company hoping that their money would be rewarded by them finding gold or other valuable things in the new world. And so they would get stock dividends from that. And that was the idea. And so they were adventurers uh, and they were capitalists. They were using their capital. And so when you hear today the, the phrase venture capitalism, it's a short, a shortened version of a venture capitalist. So, you know, one of the things they also hoped for was that they might find that uh, hidden passage to India, which does not exist. So our first colony is going to be named uh, Virginia, after Elizabeth I, the Virgin Queen. And it's founded by the Virginia Company. Uh, in May of 1607, three ships loaded with 100 men reach the Chesapeake Bay. They don't want to stay near the bay because they fear that they could be attacked by Spanish pirates. And so they sail up a river, which they named the James River, uh, named after King James, obviously. And that's about 40 miles inland. They figured that was safe enough so they wouldn't get attacked by pirates. They call their little town Jamestown. And it's probably going to be the most important settlement for the future of the United States. It's going to be the permanent one. Now, they didn't plan as well. They came to look for gold, not to farm. And they were, unsure, they were unsure how to hunt the local game. Supplies from England were unreliable. They didn't know they were going to get supplies or when because it was a 
almost a two and a half week trip across the ocean and ships sank all the time. So to rely on, to, uh, or to be able to survive, they had to rely on the natives and their, their leader, Plotin. He had gained control over 30 tribes and he'd hoped to use the English to expand his power. He goes, okay, here's a new group of people. I can align myself with them and gain control over other tribes. Well, he didn't realize the English had no interest in doing something like that. They were more interested in subjugating the natives or erasing them completely. Now, one of the leaders of the colonists was a guy named Captain John Smith. He was a swashbuckler, an adventurer, um, and it's through John Smith's uh, talents that Jamestown survived. Jamestown hits what they call the starving time, partly because you had a lot of people that were a part of this group that felt that they were noblemen and they didn't need to do work. And they would just sit around expecting other people to do work. And eventually the natives got tired of trading with the English. The English seemed so incompetent to them and the English were starting to steal their food. Interestingly enough, John Smith would have been one of the first ones to go around and map the area when he was first captured by the natives. And what helped save him was his uh, compass. They were amazed by that, and they took him in uh, in front of Watson, and they were going to, they executed his two followers, and they were going to kill Smith. But Smith claims that uh, I, the king's daughter, po uh, Pocahontas, intervened and saved his life from being killed uh, and stopped him from being executed. Now, Smith doesn't tell the story until later, and he told a similar story about when he was in Turkey and he was held in prison that the, the Turkish leader's daughter intervened. So we sort of question Smith's account, but we also do know this. We know that uh, recently in the last decade, they found a compass, which they believe is uh, John Smith's. It's, uh, they found it in uh, Jamestown, which if you go to Jamestown today in Virginia, they're still doing the archaeological, archaeological dig there. And you can see all the work they did. Well, during the starving time, John Smith enables the colony, enables the colony to survive. He has a motto, he that will not work will not eat. And so all the blue bloods had to, had to work. And so he's making sure everybody works to get food. He's also making sure that uh, he's getting some trade with the natives so they can get food that way. And at the same time, he's still mapping the area. But in 1609, Smith has to return to England after suffering some, uh, some powder burns from his gun. Some people have argued that it might have been an assassination attempt against Smith because he had ruled with such an iron fist. Well, once, he gone, once he's gone, anarchy ensues. It's everybody against everybody. Famine hits Jamestown in 1610. And in May of 1610, a relief party finds only 60 left alive. There have been over 500, uh, and now there's only 60 left alive. All poultry and livestock, including the horses, had been eaten. And one man had supposedly uh, killed his wife and ate her. And there have been some evidence uh, of bones found there uh, that people had chewed on human bones. And so for the next seven years, uh, this colony sort of limps along, struggling to make it. Uh, because really, they didn't pick a good place around Jamestown. It was in a swamp, and malaria was a problem. Fresh water was a problem. So tough times. In 1612, John Rolfe will introduce tobacco, uh, a crop that they find that they can ship to England, and it's popular there. By 1615, they're exporting tobacco. Now, to be honest, um, they even knew back then that tobacco wasn't good for you. Uh, King James referred to tobacco as that stinking weed. Uh, but they thought tobacco was great for everything as well. Uh, so, Rolf marries Pocahontas, uh, not John Smith, as you've watched in the Disney cartoon. He takes her back to London, which is probably not a good idea. Uh, London is really a cesspool of diseases. Uh, Pocahontas would not have any of the, the resistance to those diseases. And she dies in London in 1620 of smallpox, pretty terrible death. In 1618, London had begun the headright policy, and this is important. You know, this will probably show the test. It said that 
if you could get yourself to the new world, you could get 50 acres of land uh, for yourself. Now, that was important because in England, in England, all the land was taken up. Uh, the nobles had the land. You weren't going to get the land. But now you have a chance to own your own land without having to be a tenant farmer on some lord or baron's land. And if you could bring a laborer with you, you've got an additional 50 acres. So that's a lot of acreage. Now, the problem is going to be, as we'll see later on, is that these are treed acres. And so if you want to farm, it's going to take you a while to clear out that area. In 1619, this is an important year for Virginia. It's one of the most important years. And by the way, I don't ask any dates on the test. Three big things happen. First, the Virginia General Assembly meets. That means that Virginia, early on in 1619, is going to be used to governing itself. It's going to be limited to landowners, but they're going to be used to governing themselves and making their own rules. So 1619. So when we fast forward to about 150 years in the future, when the British are trying to regain control of the colonies, they've already had a long history of governing themselves. Also in 1619, a Dutch ship drops off the first Africans to an English colony. Now, we don't know a lot about these first Africans. We, we believe that some were uh, indentured servants, maybe all, in which they could get land. But they will be the first Africans that will be there, and they will be somewhat of landowners. Also in 1619, 90 young maidens arrived to be sold to the husband of their choice for the cost of the transportation. At the time, if you wanted to buy a wife, it was 125 pounds of tobacco. This was important because there was a shortage of women, and if the colony was to survive, they needed families. They needed reproduction, and so they had to get women to the new world. So those are the three big events. In 1622, John Rolfe gets killed in an Indian attack, so he dies off. And in 1624, Virginia becomes a royal colony. It was a joint stock colony owned by private investors, but once that, that company goes belly up and goes bankrupt, it becomes the purview of the king, and that's what we mean by a royal colony. Okay, so let's talk about Maryland. Uh, the establishment of Maryland. We got Virginia out of the way. Now let's get Maryland. In 1634, Maryland appears on the northern shores of the Chesapeake. It's going to be the first proprietary colony. Proprietary colony means that it's owned by a single individual. In this case, the guy is named Lord, is Sir George Calvert. Uh, his official title is the Lord Baltimore. Uh, and he had become, in 1625, a Catholic. Well, as you know, being a Catholic and Protestant in England was not, not a good thing. Uh, you were led to persecution. So he came up with this idea of starting a colony in the New World as a refuge for English Catholics. So he petitioned the king uh, to have land in the New World, a charter, which would give him the right to own the land, in the New World as a refuge for English Catholics. Well, the king issues the charter in 1632, but the Lord Baltimore has died. By then. So his son, the second Lord Baltimore, establishes a colony at St. Mary's, located on a stream near the mouth of the Potomac River. Uh, this charter by the, governor, uh, by the king allowed the Lord Baltimore uh, to make all the laws with the consent of the freemen. The freemen were the property owners. And so they're going to have a legislature too. Uh, and it's bicameral. There's going to be a two house legislature. Uh, it also allowed the Lord Baltimore to grant huge estates to people. But it was hard to get people to come here for that. Because why would you come work on a huge estate and work for somebody else when there was all this available land? So uh, they, had to, they had to switch to really the headright system to allow uh, for smaller farms. And eventually they will do what Virginia does they will uh, start farming tobacco. So if you want to know where Baltimore, why we have the name Baltimore, that's why it's called Baltimore. It's named after the Lord Baltimore. So let's talk about settling the New England area. The New England area, here we're talking about uh, Maine, Connecticut, Massachusetts, um, New Hampshire, Rhode Island, uh, those things. So let's talk about 
the, uh, the pilgrims. Now, the pilgrims, they're separatists. They wanted to create a Christian commonwealth. They wanted to be separate from the Church of England. That's a little bit different than Puritans. Puritans wanted to purify the Church of England of any Catholic remnants. So the pilgrims had been persecuted in England because they didn't believe the king had absolute power. They didn't recognize him as the head of the church of their, of their church. And so in 1607, they had fled to Holland. But they'd also faced discrimination in Holland. And they were fearful that what was happening was that their kids were becoming much more Dutch than English. And they wanted to return home, but they feared more uh, persecution. So they went to the king and they said, look, uh, can, can we have a place in the new world so that we can live in peace and have our own commonwealth? And for the plus part, for the king, probably a lot of them would die. So it's a win-win for both of them. So the king allows this. So in September of 1620, led by William Bradford, 101 men, women, and children aboard uh, the Mayflower. Only half were pilgrims. They landed at a place called Plymouth Rock, which, by the way, somebody just graffitied. How's that possible? Uh, that's near Cape Cod. Uh, named Cape Cod simply because at the time there was so much cod in the water. Uh, they said that you could drop your, your bucket and you'd be able to pull up codfish. And it's part of the reason why the British do uh, fish and chips. And have you heard that? That's, I got pop up windows coming in from my. Uh, my computer for a while. Oh, that's into those. Good. They land at Cape Cod. And the, by the way, the cod fishing is going to be critical to this, this area. In fact, if you were to go to Boston today, they have a famous wooden cod above their speaker, their house chairs, and their state legislature that's been around for a long time. In November of uh, 21st, 1620, 41 men of the uh, Mayflower create the Mayflower Compact. It's an agreement saying that they will follow the laws set down by the leaders of their own choosing. Now, this means there's not going to be a royal governor, as you might see in other colonies, appointed by the king. They're going to choose their own leaders. This begins the idea of government by consent. Well, as you can imagine, things don't go well for the pilgrims. Uh, they left in September. They arrive uh, in Massachusetts in November right when it's getting cold and they weren't prepared. Half the pilgrims die in winter. But in the spring of 1521, they meet a friendly native by the name of Squanto who shows them how to grow maize, corn. Now, maize is a new world food. You have to get used to the fact that in European circles, uh, they still call it maize. Corn for them is any type of grain. And this helps them save the colony and so they would celebrate this by holding a feast that would be later called Thanksgiving. Now, of course, that's all done by the Anglo point of view. I mean, if you're a Native American, you don't really think that Squanto is a friendly Indian. You tend to think of him as a traitor. And you don't think of the pilgrims as colonists. You tend to think of them as invaders. Now, another group were a group of people called Congregationalists. Now, these are going to be the Puritans who wanted self-governing churches, whose members would be limited to what they called visible saints. That was those people who could believe, that, who, who could show that they had received God's grace, that they were going to be saved and to go into heaven. Uh, and they did, not challenge, they did not tolerate challenges to the religious authority. They uh, were very uh, persecuting of other people, which is a good time to mention this, is that when we talk about uh, America being for freedom of uh, religion, that wasn't true at the time. It meant freedom of religion for themselves and nobody else. That's it. And so you, you'll find these Congregationalists or Puritans uh, hanging Quakers and discriminating against Baptists and other people. So these Puritans in England were, of course, persecuted by uh, the church because they wanted to purify it, and they wanted to get rid of these Catholic remnants, and that wasn't real popular. So they get land north of the Plymouth Colony, where the Pilgrims had settled, uh, for a group called the Massachusetts Bay Company. They were led by 
John Winthrop. Winthrop was a respected lawyer, and he was going to use this colony for a haven for persecuted Puritans. Now, most of the time, when you got a charter to start a colony by the king, the rule was that you had to leave the charter in England. You left it in England so that the king could change it any time. In fact, it said in the charter, you have to leave it in England. Well, Winthrop had noticed that they forgot to put that in this charter that you had to leave it in England. So he says, yoink, and he takes the charter with him. So that means the, the, the Puritans will have control of everything they want to do. In March 1630, they take a ship to the New World. And then Winthrop tells his followers on the ship, and this is one of the more famous speeches in American history, uh, the City Upon the Hill speech, in which he said, look, we have to be the moral example to the rest of the world on how we do this. We have to be a, a beacon of light. We have to be the city upon the hill. And we were going to do things right in America as opposed to doing things the way they did in Europe. And that's something that's constantly been refrained throughout American history. You hear the city upon the hill speech. Um, Reagan mentions it. Uh, George Bush Sr. had a thousand points of light, a light upon the hill. It, it plays through American history and this idea that America is going to be different than everybody else and, and, that, and the idea of American exceptionalism. Now, we're going to find the reality may not always go with the ideal, but that is the ideal. By the end of 1630, 17 ships carrying 1,000 colonists or invaders, which way you want to go, arrive. And then Boston becomes the capital. This begins what we call the one of the many great migrations uh, as Forty to 50,000 Englishmen flee to the New World. In 1644, uh, Massachusetts will create a bicameral legislature just like everybody else. Um, voters have to, used to be only we have to be church members, but now are also property owners. Now, not everything is happy in uh, Boston. You've got some dissidents. One of them is Roger Williams. Roger Williams wanted a complete break with the Church of England, and he believed that the church should have no relations with the English government or the Anglican church or with the unsaved. Eventually, he came to believe that the only true church possible was of that of he and his wife, and he wasn't so sure about his wife. Well, this is challenging the Puritans, and so they said, we don't want you. We're going to kick you back to England in 1635 uh, for heresy. Well, he escapes, and he goes and settles his own colony, now known as Rhode Island. And it's going to be the first colony that will legislate religious freedom for all. Now, the other person that's sort of a troublemaker is going to be Anne Hutchinson. She was an articulate, strong-willed, and intelligent woman. She was a wife of a prominent merchant. She had 13 children. And so after church, she would hold meetings in Boston to discuss the sermons, which was fine. But then she started beginning uh, to provide her own commentaries on religious matters. She claimed that she had a direct revelation from God, that God had told her that only one or two Puritan preachers preached the truth. And she also said that, that good works could lead to salvation. Well, this is contradictory to the Puritan doctrine of predestination that Calvin came up with, right? The idea of predestination was that, that God had already decided who was going to be saved and who was not going to be saved. And there was really nothing you could do about it. You would just have to look for uh, signs that maybe you were one of the saved. Well, that's contrary to Puritan uh, doctrine. Uh, and it was also contrary to Puritan doctrines because they said only ministers could really interpret the will of God. And, of course, her biggest sin was she was a woman. And they didn't like women speaking up. She was tried for heresy in 1637. She was banished in 1638 as a woman not fit for our society. Uh, she went to Rhode Island, but on her when she was banished, she was pregnant, but the baby was stillborn, and then critics said, well, see, that's God punishing her. In 1642, she moved to Long Island, New York, and in 1643, she and five of her children were massacred in an Indian attack. And John Winthrop said, well, this is great. This is divine justice. This is what she deserved. So while we talk about this for a moment, let's talk about this Puritan idea of predestination. 
it leads to what John Demos, the famous historian, said was the uh, uh, Puritan dilemma. How did you know you were one of the same? You know, Puritan started thinking, okay, if I'm prospering business-wise, right, and my farm's going well and I have a healthy family, that's a sign that I could be one of the saved and I'm going to church and I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. Now, you weren't supposed to have, uh, you know, an ostentation display of wealth, but you were supposed to be prosperous, and that would be a good sign. Well, the problem was, let's suppose that you have a, a farm, everything's going really well, and then lightning strikes your house and burns your house down. Well, for them, they were thinking, okay, God has punished me. And their neighbors would say, see, I knew that guy wasn't doing anything he was supposed to. Or if your child died or your crops failed, that was all seen as a sign that God was upset with you. And so that was confusing to them. And so not knowing if you were saved or what you did wrong when something bad happened to you, uh, it, was, it, was, it was confusing. And when Ben Franklin comes up with the lightning rod, there were a lot of people who said, wait a minute, you can't have a lightning rod because that's that's getting rid of God's justice. You're, you're diverting God's justice. Franklin's response was, then why did God give me the idea of building a lightning rod? So let's talk about Connecticut, Maine, and New Hampshire real briefly. I don't want to go into a lot of uh, uh, detail about that. I hope there's no Connecticut, Connecticut Kings, whatever they're called uh, in the group. Connecticut was found by Puritans, and they're looking for better lands, and they're looking for access to the fur trade. The fur trade was really going on pretty well. Uh, they were led by Thomas Hooker. Uh, they organized the colony of Connecticut, Connecticut well, it's hard to, say, to protect them from Indian attacks. In fact, the Indians did attack them, and the colony responded by uh, slaughtering 400 men, women, and children in an Indian tribe. Uh, these Connecticut's had... Uh, Indian allies, and they were shocked at the brutality of these Puritans. They later, uh, the Connecticut people began a government much like Massachusetts, in which all landholders could vote. Uh, New Hampshire and the area of Maine, Maine will not be considered its own state until 1820. It'll be part of Massachusetts. But New Hampshire and Maine were founded by a man named Sir Georges and Captain John Mason because they were looking for better lands uh, to settle. Well, uh, between uh, 1640 uh, and 1660, we saw, or let me rephrase that, between 1615 and 1640, we had a slow, no, let me rephrase that again, 1640 to 1660, I was right the first time, thanks. We had a slowdown of immigration from England, mainly because England was caught in a civil war. It was a civil war led by uh, Charles Cromwell and the Parliament. Uh, known as the Roundheads, and Cromwell was a Puritan, against Charles I, the king at this time. Uh, and it was a debate on who was going to have the most power. Well, eventually they end up uh, chopping off Charles' head's head, right? Chopping off his head. Yeah, okay, that works. Which means that he's no longer king. His son has to flee to France. And Cromwell becomes the Lord Protector of England. In other words, he becomes a Puritan state. And so a lot of Puritans go, great, now we have Puritanism here. We don't need to go somewhere else. Well, Cromwell, Cromwell eventually dies, and most English get tired of living under Puritan rule where you could go to jail for whist whistling on a Sunday. They were shutting down entertainment areas on Sundays, living by very strict uh, Puritan rule. And so the English Parliament asked that Charles II, the son of Charles, who got his head chopped off, uh, come back from France and rule over them after Cromwell dies. So he does. Now, Charles II has some grudges. He digs up Oliver Cromwell's body, uh, chops off his head, puts his head on a pike, and then takes the body and drags it around London for three days. So still going through those childhood traumas. Charles II, when he comes to power, he wants to reward people who are loyal to him. And so we will get, land, uh, the way he can reward these people is to give them colonies. He said, I'll give you land in New World because you're loyal to my dad. These will be proprietary colonies, colonies that are owned by one person. Uh, the first of these colonies will be given to eight men in the land known as the Carolinas. Now, in the Carolinas, they try to do that whole 
feudal land system too, where they'd have big mansions and then they'd have people rent little plots of land and then pay them rent. Didn't work very well because people could just move off someplace else and get some get their own land. So they switched to doing sort of a, a head right system so people could come over. Uh, they didn't care who you were to come over because they just needed people so that the colony could succeed. And so it's going to be a very ethnically uh, uh, diverse colony. Uh, slaves will be introduced, uh, and rice, oddly enough, will become an early staple crop. Uh, their exports are going to be rice and Indian slaves. Uh, and it's important to note why Indian slaves. They tried to enslave Indians uh, in the first place, but Indians could run away. And so they shipped a lot of Indians or Native Americans over to uh, the West Indies, into the islands. South Carolina will, will fail, strangely enough, and will become a royal colony uh, in 1719 and North Carolina in 1729. Not that you need to know. All right, so that brings us up to New Netherlands. Now, this is the area we now know as New York. New Netherlands was founded by the Dutch. They had hired a, an Englishman by the name of Henry Hudson to scout the area. Hudson later goes on to scout parts of Canada, becomes unpopular with his uh, crew, and now in the area we know as Hudson Bay, they put him on a boat, a little teeny tiny boat, and he was never seen from again. So the Dutch in 1626 buy Manhattan Island from the natives. Uh, they will call this New Amsterdam, this area, uh, and it'll be the capital of New Netherlands. Now, when we say that they buy this land, it's, there's a culture conflict here. For the natives, they don't understand how anybody could own the land. And they said, how can one person own land? And for the Dutch, they said, man, we're buying this so cheap. And so neither side really understood what was going on. Now, the Dutch are mainly interested in the fur trade. They're not so interested in colonization, but fur trade. They eventually end up having a, um, a conflict with the British that will lead for the Dutch expulsion of New Amsterdam and the New Netherlands. This conflict, and there's a great book on this called Nathaniel's Nutmeg. I forgot who wrote it, but it's a great book. Uh, There'd been a struggle over the nutmeg uh, industry and the nutmeg uh, trade, and that's grown mainly way over there in the East Indies. Uh, and the Dutch had won that, and people thought that nutmeg was the cure-all for everything, and it, it led to vast fortunes. Nowadays, you can walk through the grocery store, and there's plenty of nutmeg. But since they lost that, the British decided they were going to kick the Dutch out of the New World, and so they sent over the Duke of York. He kicks the Dutch out. Uh, the area becomes New York. The, uh, the main city will be New York City. But we still have the Dutch influences remaining. Uh, things like Wall Street was the Dutch name. That's where the wall was. Broadway, that was the largest uh, street, the broadest street. Uh, Brooklyn is a, uh, a Dutch name. Harlem is a Dutch name. And then we've had presidents from Teddy Roosevelt uh, to Martin Van Buren that were Dutch ancestry. And then we have... have uh, some Dutch myths, uh, Van Winkle, and our version of Santa Claus is much more Dutch. So that brings us to New Jersey. I'm not going to say a lot about New Jersey. Uh, New Jersey was founded in 1664 by a man named Sir George Carteret and another man by the name of La Lord John Berkeley. Uh, and what you need to know is that it's a, um, it's a very ethnically uh, group of people. There are Scots there, there are Quaker, English Quakers there, uh, so it's very diverse. So now let's hit Pennsylvania and Delaware as we sum this all up here in the next 15 minutes, I think. Now, uh, Pennsylvania and Delaware, Delaware are going to be founded by Quakers, uh, officially known as the Society of Friends. You know, Ross, Joey, Monica, not those friends. They've been founded in 1647 by George Fox. They believed in the doctrine of individual spiritual interpretation, which I think that's pretty self-evident that you could interpret the Bible yourself. So they had no formal sacra uh, sacraments, no formal ministry. Uh, in fact, they had religious freedom for all and equality of the sexes in religious issues. So you could go to a Quaker church 
and anybody could have a sermon. Anybody could stand up. They used the V and the Thou that was uh, declining at this time period. They declined to take oaths, and they were pacifists, meaning they didn't uh, believe in military service. So this means that they were going to be very persecuted by the king, even though they're very tolerant. They're getting persecuted because they won't fight and they won't take an oath. And so that's one of the words, Quakers. People think they were quaking because they were afraid. And like many groups, they take the name and um, use it for themselves. So George Fox, who had founded the Quakers, visits America uh, and then returns in 1673 with the idea of, hey, let's create a Quaker commonwealth in the New World. And so a famous Quaker by the name of William Penn will found the colony in 1681. He recruits Quakers to come there. He also recruits people that are related to the Quakers, the Mennonites and the Amish, uh, to come live there. And they had good relations with the Indians because the Quakers were friendly. They were non-violent. Uh, Penn bought the land from them and made sure that they didn't violate those, uh, those land boundaries. Now, he will call this area Pennsylvania, named after his father, which means Pennsylvania means Penn's Woods. In 1682, uh, the Duke of York will also grant to Penn the area of Delaware, and Delaware will become its own uh, its own colony as well. So that brings us last to the colony of Georgia. It's the last of the British colonies uh, to be established, founded by James Oglethorpe as an experiment, uh, two experiments. One was a defense against Spain, because Spain owned, owned Spanish Florida, and they were fearful that if they ever went to war, they would hit the the Carolinas, so they said, well, Georgia, that area could be sort of a, a buffer zone. And Oglethorpe was a philanthropist who had championed prison reform uh, and trying to help the poor. And so he said that, why don't we uh, have this area for poor people, debtors who have, uh, they could start a new life, criminals that they could start a new life. And by the way, almost 50,000 criminals do come to the new world. And that was the idea. Well, Part of the experiment failed. They said, look, we're, we're going to try to produce silk and wine here uh, in Georgia. That didn't work. They limited land honing, holdings. That didn't work. Rum was prohibited, and that didn't work. And then they didn't allow for the importations of slaves. It does work as a defense against Spanish Florida, but that's it. Uh, in 1753, the colony had become a, a royal colony owned by the king. They start exporting rice, indigo, num uh, lumber, naval stores, beef and pork, and they bring in slavery. So that's the establishment of all 13 colonies in a nutshell. Very quickly, it's just a survey course. We don't get to go into a lot of detail. I'll be posting another video uh, a little bit later. On uh, The next thing topic we'll, we'll talk about is colonial ways of life. We'll talk about uh, comparing the Southern and New England colonies and how they differed and what their similarities were. And then we'll probably move on to um, the Great Awakening and the Enlightenment. So I hope this helps. Um, I'll try to keep working on making it better. First time of doing it. So uh, any comments, happy to hear.